thanks to everyone for joining. Um, we're gonna we're here for a discussion of regulatory policy and key issues, some of which are um, examined in the book, reviving rationality. If you haven't already gotten it on sale now, you can uh, you can get it. Um, this event is hosted by the Institute for Policy Integrity at NYU School of Law, and um, I, I were uh, I'm lucky to have um, two panelists. Um, uh, here, so we're so we have both uh, Richard Gravez and um, Michael Livermore. So um, uh, we're uh, Richard uh, Rivez is a, a professor of law and dean emeritus at NYU School of Law. He directs NYU Law's Institute for Policy Integrity, a nonpartisan think tank dedicated to improving the quality of government decision making. He's published 10 books and roughly 80 academic articles on major issues in regulatory and environmental policy. Michael Livermore is a professor at the University of Virginia School of Law, whose research focuses on regulatory review, environmental law, cost-benefit analysis, and the application of data science techniques to legal texts. He's published widely in the top law journals, as well as in peer-reviewed legal, scientific, and social science journals. And as I mentioned, their new book, Reviving Rationality, Saving cost, basic, sorry, saving cost Benefit Analysis for the Sake of the Environment and Our Health was recently released by Oxford University Press. One thing I wanna mention is I'm gonna be asking a number of questions, but we really welcome questions from what I know is a smart and interested audience. So you'll see there's a Q&A function. And if you wanna put at any time your questions into the chat, then I will uh, be sure to look at them and be calling out some of those questions once I have a chance to um, grill our two distinguished panelists. So I thought we could start by talking about the different ways regulatory analysis has changed under the current administration. I was particularly interested in how you described what, what counts as, what, what accounts for a cost and a benefit when it's often a transfer of wealth from one entity to another like in, in instances like the interior department valuation rule and an education department rule on student loans. Could you describe how kind of reg this regulatory accounting has changed under the administration and either one of you? Sure, um, maybe I'll start. Um, you know, I, I think what's really striking is that there have been a um, certain level of consensus across administrations of both parties in the past about what it meant to do good cost benefit analysis. It doesn't mean, of course, that uh, the Bush administration would have done it identically to the Clinton administration or the Obama administration would have done it identically to the Bush administration. That obviously wasn't true, but there were certain established norms that, that were followed and the book calls them sort of guardrails around the process. And I think what's most striking about this administration, the Trump administration, is the degree to which it just drove right through the guardrails. So let me start with the example that you gave of transfer payments. Um, the transfer payments where money shifts hands from one party to another typically don't count as costs or benefits in a cost benefit analysis. Um, and that's consistent with the approach taken in OMB Circular A4, which is kind of the guidance document that, um, that instructs agencies on how to do it. And the reason is that, what's, that it's a wash. There's money, you know, what's a cost to one side is a benefit to another side and, and there's a wash. What might be counted are incentive effects. If as a result of some payment, uh, some actor changes their behavior, that behavior might change in a desirable way or in an undesirable way. And those, those effects would actually get counted. So for example, in the, in the royalty case, in the BLM case that you mentioned, um, the Trump administration took an action to reduce the royalties paid by companies extracting fossil fuels from federal lands. And so what was gonna happen is that the companies were gonna pay the federal treasury less money. And the Trump administration counted that as a benefit to the companies. The benefit was they were gonna pay less money. It ignored the fact that on the other side, there was a cost to the US treasury, it was gonna get less money, it would have been a wash. What should have been counted instead is whether as a result of paying less money, 
the fossil fuel companies would have now extracted more fossil fuels, which would have had bad environmental consequences. Those bad environmental consequences should have been counted as a harm, but the transfer shouldn't have been counted as either a cost or benefit. And counting it as a benefit was obviously one side, because it was another side to that transaction. In the, um, in the education uh, rule that you mentioned in your opening question, um, which was a rule uh, designed, an Obama administration rule designed to protect the frauded uh, student borrowers, which the Trump administration repealed, there what they counted as a benefit was savings to the federal treasury ignoring that the money the federal treasury wasn't getting was gonna be money that these defrauded student borrowers weren't getting. Um, so that should have been a wash. It shouldn't be counted as a cost or a benefit, but what's striking is that not paying the treasury money was counted as a good thing uh, in, the co in the fossil fuel case. It was better for the fossil fuel companies to have the money than the federal treasury. But in the student borrower case, it was better for the borrowers to have the money than, um, than the federal treasury. What we say in the book is that by transitivity, the Trump administration was telling us that it preferred um, fossil fuel extractors in the federal treasury, and it preferred the federal treasury to student borrowers. Presumably, it therefore preferred uh, fossil fuel companies to student borrowers, which I think is consistent with its general policy. So that's kind of one of the examples of, there are many that the book works out explaining how established techniques were mangled and used in ways that would not have been recognizable to prior administrations of, of either party. Got it. And Michael, are there other, you know, either techniques that really stand out to you or, or kind of thoughts on the, on the legal implications of, of really jettisoning things that had, had really guided this kind of analysis in the past? Right. Well, I think it's worth particularly emphasizing just this is not normal at all, right? This is that kind of normal politics. There's, okay, there's a degree of normal disagree, disagreement that you're gonna expect between administrations. There's methodological debates. This is so far outside the realm, like Rick, Ricky's example, you can explain in two minutes and any kind of reasonable person can recognize that taking money out of one person's pocket, putting it in another person's pocket, isn't like a benefit that doesn't come without a cost. One person gets the dollar, another person pays the cost. Th these are kind of very, very core established parts of the, the technique um, that have just kind of been left by the wayside. So I think um, legally, one of the implications of the general approach of the Trump administration has been that they've had a very difficult time in court um, and have faced uh, you know, hostile, hostile um, judges you know, on a wide range of issues. The judges aren't hostile, the judges are hostile to the arguments that are being offered because the arguments are so bad. Um, and the Trump administration has had a difficult time defending its decisions in court because again, it's just departing from well-established norms um, that just really aren't a matter of, of debate um, and uh, amongst, you know, amongst reasonable people. Yeah. And uh, what one uh, issue I wanted to drill on down is that the Environmental um, Protection Agency is about to finalize a cost benefit analysis rule that applies to all new Clean Air Act rules. Uh, and that they that they come up with, and I was wondering um, if you all could talk about you know this specific proposal, how significant you think it will be, and again how it it kind of shifts the way regulators typically judge the costs and benefits of protecting public health. Sure, I mean this rule would be very significant. Um, the administration has indicated that plans to finalize it <coughs> in the next fifty days, and I assume that it will. Uh, I think the main thing it will do is it will call into question the use of co-benefits, of indirect benefits to justify regulation. Uh, this is an issue um, in which the administration has taken a very sort of strong position that's inconsistent with the established consensus. I mean, Circular A4 says that in performing a cost-benefit analysis, all costs and all benefits should be taken into account, whether they're direct or indirect. Um, the Trump administration in the environmental context um, has um, declined to use co-benefits co um, in its action on a very significant rule uh, limiting the hazardous air pollutant emissions of power plants, uh, where there were significant co-benefits. That is, the direct benefits were the reductions of hazardous air pollutants. The indirect benefits were the reductions of particulate matter, which are a very um, serious polluter with enormous health consequences. Uh, and it basically ignored benefits, annual benefits between 36 billion and 90 billion dollars um, 
you know, quite extraordinary. And um, it, because of the tens of thousands of lives that uh, would be lost as a result, um, you know, they were being saved as a result of the rule that it wanted to uh, roll, roll, you know, that it called into question. Now, so not looking at co-benefits is inconsistent with economic theory. It's also dealing with this matter in an extremely um, um, contradictory way because the Trump administration has taken a very strong position that indirect costs must be counted. And they've been very aggressive in counting indirect costs in the cost benefit analysis. So they're basically saying that the indirect consequences of regulation must be taken into account if they're negative and should be ignored if they're positive. I mean, there's no scenario under which an approach like that is rational in any way. And I mean, I really doubt that this approach when properly teed up in the courts would ever survive an arbitrary and capricious challenge under the Administrative Procedure Act, because you don't have to be like a legal expert to understand that this is arbitrary. I mean, it's kind of like the, the embodiment of arbitrariness. And actually it gets worse. Um, because even though the Trump administration has taken a strong position against co-benefits in a number of proceedings, it's also been very willing to embrace co-benefits when doing so suited its deregulatory uh, purposes. So um, with respect to the hazardous air pollutant rule, the Trump administration said, no, we're going to ignore all these particular matter uh, benefits. They're the indirect benefits of the regulation. This regulation is, is promulgated under a statute that is designed to reduce other pollutants. In justifying the rollback to the clean car standards, this is the most significant deregulatory environmental move of the Trump administration. The Trump administration has really bad co-benefit, really bad cost-benefit analysis, and even by its own terms, show that the rule would cause net harms. But even setting aside that issue, the biggest chunk of benefits that the Trump administration is considering in its, in its analysis are safety benefits. And the safety benefits are co-benefits. From EPA's perspective, they're definitely co-benefits because EPA does not have jurisdiction over auto safety. EPA's jurisdiction in this case is over the reduction of air pollutants. NHTSA, EPA's partner agency, does have a safety jurisdiction but not under the provision under which it sets the CAFE standards. And it's doing that under fuel economy standards. Right. Under the yeah, energy it is policy just a, it's a statute, the Energy Policy Conservation Act, that was a uh, response to the energy crisis. And it's about reducing our dependence on foreign oil. It's not about safety. So, I mean, safety, you know, might be, it, is, it might be a cognizable effect if they're done the analysis, right? But it's clearly a co-benefit. So in addition to saying that indirect consequences are taken into account, if they're negative, but ignored if they are positive, which is what the Trump administration is doing in calling co-benefits into question, it's further saying that co-benefits will be taken into account if they justify deregulation and they will be ignored if they stand in the way of deregulation. So this is a double contradiction and each one of them is the embodiment of arbitrary and capricious conduct. And we spend a lot of time in our book developing okay. that example as well. Okay, well, worth, when, what, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. I think it's worth just taking a step back to think a little bit about what, what we expect out of regulatory decision making. What is, what are the, what, what, how should this proceed? And then it kind of it places in relief how bad what's gone on in the last four years is. Because some of these are the details that we get into are, are kind of technical and they sound perhaps a little wonky to the uninitiated. Um, <laughs> but what we expect is for agencies to, you know, engage in reasoned decision making, take evidence into consideration, do balanced analysis. Now, again, there's going to be disagreements about how you do this or not. But what we've seen is just the cynical manipulation of these techniques in ways that can be somewhat in the weeds and somewhat technical, but that reflect total disregard for the for the project that is that underlies this entire process, which is reasoned decision making, use of evidence reliance on expertise to make decisions. And so these details that we're getting into are important because they kind of shine a light on um, really what is this kind of more fundamental departure of the Trump administration. Although, all right, I'm going to, uh, before going on, I do want to ask a question, which is, which is, in other words, sure, uh, you know, all politicians have their goals and they try to use numbers to advance their goals. So, well, well, I, I take your point that the current administration has taken this to an extreme degree. 
how how much have other how much have other previous administrations kind of fiddled with numbers in a particular way to drive outcomes? Are there things that come to mind that aren't as egregious as this, but are clear indicators of how previous administrations have used the regulatory analysis process to advance their goals? So, so one of the um, you know one of the ways that I kind of think about this is we talk about these guardrails, and there's kind of the legitimate areas of disagreement, and then there's yeah. like just kind of flagrant manipulation of the technique or partisan meddling or. or and the like. So let me take, let's take an example of kind of legitimate emphasis. So for example, so the Obama administration in its, um, in its approach to cost benefit analysis took a particular interest in behavioral economics. Um, it, Cass Sunstein was OIRA administrator. There was some, actually the car rule that, that Ricky mentioned um, you know, had a, has a behavioral economics component to, the, to valuation of some of the benefits. Um, and the Obama administration just kind of emphasized improving the technique to understand uh, how to appropriately value these kind of behavioral economic effects. Now, that, I don't think of that as fiddling with the numbers and manipulation. It's a legitimate inquiry, but it's one that's, I think, informed by the agenda of the administration, the broader political goals and the broader kind of way of looking at the world. Um, under George uh, W. Bush, the EPA proposed a couple of rules that um, were oriented towards um, uh, using market mechanisms to achieve pollution reduction goals. Mm -hmm. now, that's more of an instrument choice thing than a cost benefit um, thing, but also, you know, there are valuation questions that come into, say, like predicting what the cost on industry is going to be if you use command and control versus market-based right. mechanisms and the like. And so it's perfectly natural for an administration that views itself as business friendly to, you know, emphasize that part of cost benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. But what's what they shared, even though they had those different emphases, is that in, in that undertaking, they more or less in good faith try to get the numbers right. It wasn't like the, 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 you know, the, the goal of EPA under Obama was, let's juke the, the, the behavioral economics literature to try to pretend like there are more benefits than there are, right? It was, I think, honestly, a, 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 an inquiry intended to get at something like the truth. Um, so, so I think that's the difference. The emphasis and priorities change, but ideally what you want is some kind of good faith effort that carries through. And I think that that's the real sea change that we've seen. Right. And the other thing that's different across prior administrations, they pick different priorities to regulate. That is the cost benefit analysis sort of comes into play once you've decided to do a regulation and you kind of, it's, it's being used to, um, um, to, to justify uh, the regulation, but the Obama administration might have decided to undertake a regulatory action in a particular area, and the Bush administration might have decided to undertake it in a different area. And those decisions were not governed by cost benefit analysis, but once they decided to act in that area, I think they, act, they stayed within the guardrails, to use a sort of metaphor in the book, in doing the analysis to justify what they were trying to do. So, you know, we're not suggesting that administrations have given up any sort of poli their policy making function to right. uh, cost benefit analysis. They clearly haven't, or that these prior administrations were all doing the same thing and this one was different. But the difference is that when they actually engage in the analysis, it's not that the prior ones were all perfect and so on, but they were more likely to be undertaken in good faith. And here, I think this administration has essentially taken these tools and used them in whatever way um, helped it achieve its objective in a particular regulatory area with no sort of concern about whether there were inconsistencies across the way it was acting in other regulations. Yeah. And I'm going to ask, well, we'll go to questions later, since there's something that wants that uh, Kate Schaus wants to be clarified. I'm going to ask her question very quickly. I, I think this answer is in reference to the safe rule. She said, can you give an example of an EPA rulemaking analysis that included indirect costs, but not co-benefits? I may have under misunderstood your comment, but I think you suggested the administration aggressively counted indirect costs while, while discounting co-benefits. I'm familiar with the treatment of co-benefits, but not sure what you're referring to. Uh, by their consideration of indirect costs. Ricky, can you clarify that? Well, indirect costs, um, effects on employment, sort of broader costs on the economy as a result of, for example, the increase in energy prices. I mean, EPA, in, the, in deciding not to, um, to make the finding that the regulation of hazardous air pollutants from power plants was not appropriate and necessary, EPA definitely considered indirect costs. I mean, in fact, it was told it had to consider indirect costs by the Supreme Court 
um, in Michigan versus EPA. Um, uh, so it, can, it, it tried to take into account these broader economic impacts, but then said that uh, the conservation of indirect benefits was inappropriate. Okay. There's also a little bit of a kind of a fudge factor going on here too, because in a sense, in the safe rule, kind of the indirect benefits of the safe rule, you could understand of the, the negation of the indirect purported indirect costs of the Obama rule that it was repealing, right? So there's this mm -hmm. kind of weird, you know, that's the problem with treating benefits and costs differently than each other. That's why you want consistency because at some level you can kind of recharacterize these things in different ways um, that allow you to, to manipulate the outcomes in all kinds of ways if, if, if you're gonna be in that business. Got it. And now, obviously, when you all were writing this, you didn't know how the election would turn out, but uh, now we do. Uh, uh, with, you know, some people might not uh, quite endorse that, but uh, we're, we're, I, I uh, will stick by the, the ballot counting that has been done in multiple states multiple times. And so in that context, um, I wanted to ask about a, a, a rule that's obviously going to make a comeback and get your thoughts on it. Um, you write about the social cost of carbon and how, of course, that um, how how that was evaluated changed under the current uh, you know under the current administration. And what's interesting is I was just uh, talking to a senator yesterday for a story we're going to we're working on, of course, dealing with you know what will happen under the new administration. And the senator remarked, "You got to take that social cost of carbon and you have to apply it to every single you know rule possible. That's going to be one of the things that." you know, at least this person anticipates would happen. And certainly there's every reason to expect that. So I was wondering if you all could both talk about, you know, this concept and also um, if it's coming back, does one simply pick up and dust off and, and use the price that was established, uh, the level that was established under the previous administration? How would you go about reevaluating it now that time has passed and we know more about climate impacts? Right. And I'd love to get your yeah, I mean, I think this is crucial and it will have to happen. Um, I mean, it's possible that the Biden administration will decide as an interim measure um, to uh, start using the Obama number, um, which is the only scientifically um, uh, defensible number for reasons that we can discuss. But that would have to be the beginning of the inquiry and not the end of the inquiry. Um, in January of 2017, in the last two weeks of the Obama administration, the National Academy of Sciences completed a review of the social cost of carbon that had been um, requested by the Obama administration. And that had a lot of recommendations for what should be done uh, to make the social cost of carbon consistent with the sort of best uh, economic and scientific thinking. Um, and it was basically a call for the administration to do it. The Trump administration indicated it really had no interest in doing that. And so it didn't really attempt to um, answer any of those questions. Instead, it adopted something that it calls a domestic number, um, which is not really uh, an accounting for the domestic impacts. It's a very, it's, it's accounting for a, a subset of the domestic impacts. And very recently, a federal district judge in Oakland, California actually Term the domestic number arbitrary and capricious because it was essentially, you know, just a subset of issues. Um, it, it, for example, didn't consider uh, the impact on U.S. military installations overseas, the role of the U.S. as a geopolitical power that would be affected if like 10 million people start walking across the Indian subcontinent, didn't consider how the reactions of other countries, if the U.S. reacts irresponsibly on climate change, could end up affecting the U.S. and so on. So there's a lot of elements that even like in a proper domestic inquiry would have to be taken into account. And at the same time, they considered the global costs because they took it all, they looked at all of the costs and a, a non-trivial proportion of the U.S. stock market is owned by foreigners. And if you really were trying to like carve out domestic impacts, you would carve out that component. So this was all illogical. So, so this all has to be redone. Um, the General Accountability Office, the Government Accountability Office uh, recently released a study calling a lot of the Trump techniques into question, which have to be factored in by the new group. So I assume that, um, I mean, a likely scenario I think would be to make the outgoing Obama number, the interim number, uh, setting up a new interagency working group to consider the recommendations of the National Academy of Sciences of the Government Accountability Office, and then to also bring it up to date um, with sort of new uh, scientific and economic um, uh, learning. For example, there's a very strong economic argument for having declining discount rates for 
um, for consequences that are far into the future. Um, there's more of a consensus now than there was four years ago. So that'll have to get re-looked at. So I think this will be a, a very important inquiry because so many actions of the federal government have greenhouse gas uh, consequences. And so yeah, the, and Michael, the, maybe you could talk a little about that, of, of how would this play, both, first of all, how high do you think, maybe you could refresh our number, I mean, I think I know the number, but where, where was it set under Obama, and, you know, how high it potentially could go, and also, yeah, how would, how would this ultimately end up shaping, you know, just a slew of decisions that the next administration would make? Right, so, so one of the things I think is interesting is that using the social cost of carbon to evaluate kind of relevant regulations, it should not be a progressive rallying cry. That's like just basic sound economic analysis of rulemakings. It should not be something that we have to like promote through some you know, major political action. It's, it's just how the technique works. In fact, the Obama administration, it, it was the Georgia administration, George W. Bush administration uh, in a rulemaking having to do with uh, fuel economy, um, uh, didn't use a social cost of carbon and the Ninth Circuit knocked them down and said, look, any reasonable analysis of rules that have major greenhouse gas consequences have to use the social cost of carbon. Otherwise, you're just putting a thumb on the scale. And so this isn't like, shouldn't really be terribly controversial, but you're right. Um, it has a really a wide range of consequences because so many actions of the federal government um, do have uh, you know, do affect greenhouse gas emissions. So this is going to be important kind of most obviously for rules that directly regulate greenhouse gas emission, say in the electricity generating sector or the transportation sector, but energy efficiency rules are another important area. Um, lots of what goes on um, in, the, in the energy department, um, natural resource, uh, fossil fuel extraction decisions and, uh, and the like. So there's really a wide range of different contexts. So it's not just EPA, there's energy, there's Interior, there's FERC, there's all kinds of agencies that potentially, um, you know, are going to use, uh, uh, should be using in any case, obviously, the social cost of carbon and should be using the right one. Um, I think it's hard to say ultimately it, where it will go in terms of the numbers. I mean, just to, you know, the discount rate issue is is very substantial. It's one that's been dated, debated for many years in the, in the literature on, on climate change economics. Um, you know, that's the kind of question that can have a, a, a big impact on the social cost of carbon. But we're, you know, from the, if we're talking about kind of the Obama administration numbers, we're, we're in the neighborhood of 40 to $50, basically. Right. Um, and then if we start updating it, um, I think the, the general thrust of the literature is that it's going to go up rather than down, right? So, so using declining discount rates, taking into account the recent science, which indicates that climate change is even more harmful, bringing in more of the damages um, caused by climate change that in the Obama estimate um, just were not quantified. So there's almost anything that you do in reality that's gonna make the number more accurate, it's very likely to increase the number. Got it. Um, one of the other things that you write about in the book is kind of the virtues of regulatory review and kind of analyzing how, you know, how things played out. And it is, it is interesting that when I, you know, I cover again all these all these environmental and energy rules, and there are these estimates. And then, you know, frequently something that's remarked on is that you know the costs of compliance, for example, might not actually be quite as high as were estimated at the time. Um, I'm sure there are also examples where it's the reverse. So, could you talk about how that could be strengthened in a new administration um, that would that would actually you know lead to better decision making going forward? Yeah, I think. Yeah. One of the benefits of OIRA review is that it can um, uh, promote uh, methodological improvements in the way that agencies do their work. And actually, Mike has written an important article about this issue. And so, for example, this question about the estimation of costs, I mean, there is this view out there that has gotten some empirical analysis that the agency basically considers, typically has considered costs based on um, sort of like end of the pipe technologies at the time the regulation is set, but that over time industry figures out how to like change their processes in a way that makes it cheaper to, um, um, uh, to meet the, re the requirements. And that as a result, industry has overestimated the cost. You know, the empirical studies aren't um, definitive. There's probably more work that can be done in that area. And because OIRA sees these issues coming from different agencies, it can play a really important role in promoting, um, you know, good economic analysis. Also, different agencies have extremely different levels of economic sophistication. EPA has a spectacularly strong 
uh, economic shop uh, with a couple of dozen PhD economists. Uh, that's not true for other agencies. It's not even true for other agencies in the natural, in the, in the environment, the natural resource space. Um, and so OIRA can sort of help diffuse the knowledge that some agencies have uh, to help uh, other agencies, That's, th 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 that is an important function. It also can make sure that the government doesn't act across purposes. You know, an agency kind of sees a slice and it could be that um, there are synergies that are being overlooked or that uh, something an agency will do might hurt other agencies. So this interagency review process that's run by OIRA is, has independent value that goes beyond just the review of the regular impact analysis that an agency does on an individual regulation. Right. Michael, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it, we, think we can generally share views on this. Um, one of the, there's, there's also, you know, one of the benefits of regulatory review is also just the kind of second set of eyes issue mm -hmm. that, that agencies kind of, again, are kind of in the weeds of their, um, of their analyses of the issues that they tend to regulate. Um, and OIR just kind of serves as a check, as a way of saying, you know, um, just checking the agency's work. Um, and, you know, there's just value to that. The other kind of piece of OIRA's uh, importance is kind of being a, uh, the steward of certain um, continuity between administrations and between agencies. One of the really kind of big red flags is when you see inconsistencies between agencies or the same agency rendering in inconsistent decisions that even if we're not doing cost benefit analysis like totally perfectly, or we haven't selected, for example, the perfect social cost of carbon, it would be very strange to have an agency use a very high social cost of carbon in one rule and a very low social cost of carbon in another rule. It's just giving you an indication that the analysis isn't doing any work, right? It's just being used to justify what was a decision that was made on political grounds. And part of what OIRA does is just, you know, preserve that kind of consistency through documents like the A4 circular by, you know, weighing in on particular agency rulemakings and, and particular analyses just to, in, in that kind of consistency vein as well. Got it. And I'm going to move to questions in a second because we have some good ones queued up. But I, I am curious, um, Ricky, why is it that EPA particularly has a good shop? I mean, I'm sure that's just like the culture of the agency, but like did it start with someone back, you know, a few decades ago or what, what, what accounts for that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a here in this. Um, Alma Garkland, who is the director of the National Center on e Economics, has been at EPA since the mid 80s. Um, and I think through the force of his intellect and um, um, his organization skills has, has built a terrific, terrific shop. It's also the case that the environmental rules actually have the biggest costs and the biggest benefits. Um, so, um, you know, there's reason why um, right. EPA should be there. And, and yeah, part, you have some statistic about like they accounted for 80% of, yes. of like, the benefits. Something like that. And it's mostly um, uh, particular matter reductions. I mean, they're doing a lot exactly. of work, which is not surprising. The Trump administration went after particular matter reductions in any way it could. And the best way for them to do it was by calling co-benefits into question, even though there's really no basis for that. I mean, I think also, um, you know, I think economic analysis at EPA um, was built up in part um, in order to um, counteract um, sort of forces within the federal government, you know, in, in Republican administrations, but maybe even uh, in some democratic administrations that were less favorable. And so, um, you know, I was on the uh, EPA um, Science Advisory Board that, that reviewed the first guidelines on economic analysis in the 1990s. And mm -hmm. that ended up determining the value of statistical life, which is now roughly $10 million. It's a very important number. And until then, you know, when we did this work, we ended up justifying a number of 5.9 million 1997 dollars. The 10 million is just that number adjusted for inflation. So it survived like a quarter century. And at that point, um, OIRA was requiring essentially analysis under a $1 million number, which wasn't actually defensible in any way. And so EPA, but, but it was, so EPA did a lot of this analysis early on in order to be able to justify its regulations through and get them through the um, inter the OIRA process. And uh, that turned out to be a very successful uh, endeavor. And eventually, um, you know, that number stuck, other agents started using that, OIRA embraced it. Um, but, you know, they're, they're historical. I, I think it's a combination of um, um, leadership and individual's leadership, ALS. Um, mm -hmm. the, the fact that the consequences were so big 
And the fact that EPA realized that in order to be successful, it needed, it, it needed to build up this expertise. And, and there was support for that across both Democratic and Republican administrations in the past. There's, a, there's another little addendum to this story, which is that yeah. there are a, a, a number of very important agencies have not traditionally gone through a wire review. So the kind of so-called independent agencies like the SEC or the FCC that for many years right. were not, um, their rulemaking just kind of didn't go through the OIR process. So there was there's a kind of a less of a direct incentive for them to build out these, uh, you know, real, really sophisticated cost benefit analysis oriented kind of economic capacity. Correct. Excellent. All right. So I'm going to start asking questions we've got. And my one request is to the extent that you can put it in the Q&A section rather than the chat section. It's just easier for me to track it, but I'm checking both. Um, so uh, one person asks, are healthcare costs included in cost benefit analysis maybe as part of the social costs? Apologies if I missed this, but so yes, could one of you speak to that question? Sure. So um, Ricky was just mentioning the value of statistical life, which is which is used to um, to address more you know regulations that have mortality risk reductions uh, consequences. So when you reduce particulate matter in the air, um, it saves lives. That's just kind of the basic reality. Um, it also stops hospitalizations and other kind of non-mortality um, related effects. Now, it actually turns out that the mortality effects just swamp everything else because we value our lives pretty highly in American society and just generally as human beings. Um, but uh, where, uh, where other effects are important, it certainly can include healthcare costs. Um, but when also they include the hospital, when they always, when they issue things saying this many avoided hospital, hospital visits, they, they've included that, right? Yeah, exactly. That kind of thing. Averted asthma cases, things that have right. a kind of a welfare consequence. But it's less important to note that sometimes people can think that it's all just about kind of dollars and cents, right? That it's just the fiscal accounting, the, the kind of greenbacks going one way or the other. But a lot of what cost benefit analysis is about is valuing effects on our well-being. So the effect of an asthma attack on somebody isn't just the expenditure, um, like on a kid, right? It's not just the expenditure on the hospital or the parents lost wages or something. It's also the negative effects, the negative welfare effects. It, it, you know, it's very unpleasant. It's, 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 it, uh, it's, it's, it hinders your ability to do other things. And so that also counts. It's not just the dollars and cents. But in other words, but does that, do they, do they attribute a dollar figure to that? Where, where possible. So that where ideally possible. that's the idea, that's what you do. So okay. that is in principle, um, all of that would be given a dollar figure. Um, sometimes it doesn't just, you know, because it's difficult to value or it's, it's, not a, it's not one of the major consequences of a regulation, but in principle, all of that is absolutely given a value. Got it, okay. Uh, Catherine Kling asks, what are your thoughts about how to do a better job of incorporating the distributional consequences, particularly in terms of racial disparities, when benefit cost analysis is used as an important component of decision making? Yeah. I think that's a hugely important question. And my prediction is that it will be a priority of the Biden administration. I mean, it's indicated um, its concern uh, for distribution, environmental justice. You know, this is not a totally new area. I mean, the executive order is going back, um, certainly to the Clinton order, um, say that regulatory impact analysis should take into account distributional consequences. And the Obama executive order actually added some more language along those lines. But the truth of the matter is that in practice, uh, distributional consequences play a very limited effect. Um, and so there is significant review by OIRA of the cost benefit analyses and significant effort by the agency to prepare um, the cost benefit analysis, but the distributional analysis is often boilerplate or you know, really kind of a quick throwaway at the end of the document. And that has, I predict that will change, it has to change. Part of the problem is that there are less well-recognized techniques for how to perform the distributional analysis. You know, what counts as an effective group? How big does it have to be? Uh, we're not gonna like, you know, sort of like add up distributional consequences at each individual, that would be like kind of impossible. Um, Circular A4, which is the guidance on cost benefit analysis, doesn't even say anything about distribution. So it doesn't give any agencies any guidance on how they should do it. I predict that one of, um, you know, I think that the um, Biden administration's efforts in the uh, regulatory review of IRA space will center on in three areas um, that we've mostly talked about. I mean, the first is like getting rid of all this underbrush of very bad analysis that the Trump administration is leaving us. Uh, the second will be to modernize um, the, 
the techniques, for example, as we talked in the social cost of carbon to kind of bring it up to date of kind of good science, economics, and so on. And the third is going to be this, trying to come up with uh, proper ways of accounting distribution and making sure that it becomes a robust part of the agency evaluation process and of the OIRA review process. So those are, I see as the three challenges for the Biden administration. And in terms of the, the things that you would look at, I mean, if you could give a couple of a few concrete examples, it would be the idea that, for example, if you're going to have a polluting facility, particularly like near and a community of, of color or low income community, things like that. I mean, kind of how certain certain Americans would be more affected would be. Yes. You know, yes. Yeah. So example, the burden or what would be other things that you. Would yeah. Do? So, for example, I mean, you know, the, the environmental standards are mostly medium by medium and pollutant by pollutant standards. We're regulating like, you know, particular matter emissions from uh, for air. And, and maybe those standards are all OK for some people, but not for others. So if you get, you know, if you're subject to a few of these risks, you're fine. If you're subject to a lot of these risks, like if you live in Cancer Alley in, in, in Louisiana between uh, New Orleans and Baton Rouge, um, that's not so good. Um, certain communities are more vulnerable. And so a risk might be okay for kind of a less sensitive community, might not be so okay for a vulnerable community. Some communities have better access to medical care. A risk that might, you know, asthma is much scarier if you don't have access to a hospital um, because you're 100 miles away from a hospital. So all of those factors um, have to be evaluated, but the sort of analytical techniques to do it in a consistent um, in a consistent and uh, way have to be developed. And there has to be some consensus around that. And, um, and that would be a challenge and an important one. It's also, it's, it's a very cross cutting set of issues too. So what Ricky just mentioned is kind of, a, is a scientific question. Really, it's not, if there are, if there are certain communities that are subject to, to uh, synergistic risks or multiple risks, then the last risk has more consequences in the world. And so it's just a matter of getting the science straight. Now, what the kind of equity and justice element of that is, is it calls our attention to that scientific problem, right? It calls our attention to the need to devote resources to that particular scientific risk, you know, risk analysis question. And I think that's one of the important ways that distribution can be threaded through the entire process of kind of risk analysis and cost benefit and cost benefit analysis it's not kind of one single technique that you're just going to insert in, you know, at the end of the equation. It's a lot about appropriately accounting for particular risks, for, the, for just accounting and acknowledging how costs and benefits are distributed, um, and doing that kind of hard work of understanding the effects of regulation and regulatory decisions uh, on the world, but in, in, this, in these ways where distri the distribution matters. Got it. Um, and then from Jonathan Wiener, we have, what are your thoughts on whether the value per statistical life should vary or be similar across agencies? Should there be more government-wide consistency in this, just in the same way that uh, IWG, I don't know what IWG stands for, had fostered for the social cost of carbon? Um, one, would, um, what, one would assume that you would have consistency. Um, I mean, would there be I mean, any reason not to, uh, not to do so? Or, well, yeah, or, or how, how much does it vary? So um, what, so there's a couple, so there is a difference between the social cost of carbon and the uh, value of statistical life, which is that um, every ton of greenhouse gas emissions kind of mixes in the atmosphere and contributes in a small marginal way to a global effect, right? Whereas when the Department of Transportation regulates automobile safety um, and averts uh, traffic fatality, that is different than when EPA uh, uh, bans a pesticide and that results in a averted case of cancer. So they're both mortality risks, but there's a lot of that surrounds those mortality risks. It's not just the kind of basic fact that you increase your risk of dying, that the context is different, the type of uh, the morbidities that are associated with those ways of dying are different. And so the risks that different agencies regulate are actually different from each other. So that is, so without endorsing whether there should be a, a uniform value or not, that's kind of the case. So it, it, it can be kind of intuitive to say, well, it should, it's obvious that it should be the same across all of government. And that's actually a very strong case that that is, that should be the way it is for the social cost of carbon. But there is this kind of countervailing factor, which is that the risks that agencies regulate are often different from each other. And so that, that may, 
uh, create some space for a justification for slightly different approaches to some of these matters. Yeah, I mean, my take on this is that there is a fair amount of consistency, even if they're not identical. So there's not a lot of variation. Uh, there clearly should not be mindless variation. As kind of Mike said, if there's agents that are using are doing something slightly different, they should have their reasons for doing that. But I don't think this is um, a big issue right now. I mean, compared to some of the others, I mean, there's I think been pretty broad acceptance of this number and of the use of this number across agencies. So I, I wouldn't recommend that, that uh, further um, um, efforts to harmonize are. Um, are necessary. On the other hand, I mean, there is some uh, significant new empirical work uh, done uh, by um, Kip Viscusi, who is kind of like the architect of a lot of the early studies as well, suggesting that the current numbers are actually underestimates and are kind of inconsistent with sort of um, more modern economic theory and empirical um, and kind of empirical analysis. And I think th th that might be worth looking at. I mean, not so much for further consistency, but for modernization to make sure that the number reflects um, the best and most recent uh, scientific work. Got it. Um, and then Lisa Robinson has a, a, an interesting point and I'll just thought I'd throw it out there and see if you either of you have thought, she said, our work suggests that the distributional analysis, oh wait, hold on, uh, to date, to the extent that it's been conducted has focused largely on the benefits rather than the costs. An even harder question in my view is how costs and net benefits are distributed. It would be great to see more work on this. Is there anything interesting that either of you have seen on that or, or you know, thoughts on, on how that would influence? Yeah, I, I think the distribution analysis should be done on both sides. So, and I, I've kind of written in the past about this. So, for example, um, the regulation of um, environmental regulations affecting power plants um, are hugely important, have enormous net benefits. But on the cost side, uh, they have negative consequences on coal communities in West Virginia and other places. Um, and um, and I think those you know, should be considered. Um, and actually the Obama administration actually tried to um, put in place some programs to help uh, coal miners in West Virginia. I mean, they were actually cynically opposed by Republicans who, did, who purported to be their friends, but actually didn't want them help because that would have reduced somewhat the political pressure against the regulations. And so they wanted to like promote this kind of war on coal rhetoric and, um, and the Obama administration's concerns about coal miners were somewhat inconvenient. Or for example, if we stop, um, or significantly reduce extraction of, um, um, if our society ended up reducing the extraction of natural resources on federal lands or stopping it altogether in some instances, there are gonna be communities in those lands that are gonna be adversely affected. And I think those consequences should be considered. Um, you know, Some of them may not have a lot of other opportunities in the, in, in the job market, and maybe these communities may be somewhat isolated, might be harder to retrain people. So I think there should be a federal, um, federal attention to those issues. I think distribution is, uh, is important um, on both the cost side and the benefit side. And actually, if we don't pay attention on the cost side, we might create a political feedback um, that then stands in the way of regulations that are very highly desirable uh, from a social welfare perspective. Part of the value of the analysis here too is also um, just to get a, a clear picture to help inform kind of the or at least counterbalance some of the rhetoric around the distribution of costs as well. Um, because, so just a core example of this is uh, employment or jobs effects associated with regulation. So mm -hmm. we're likely, I'm gonna make a prediction. Uh, in the next few years, we're gonna start to hear the phrase job killing regulation an awful lot. Because of my little prediction, you can take it to the bank. Um, <laughs> and part of what's going, what's gonna happen, again, this is a little prediction, is we're gonna start to see these um, numbers come out of millions and millions of jobs that are going to be lost due to the regulations that are going to be proposed by the Biden administration. And these numbers are going to be supported by something that looks like economic analysis. There will be like numbers involved and maybe some charts and stuff. Um, and then um, and then I'm going to make a further prediction, which is none of those job losses are going to materialize. And the reason I feel comfortable making this prediction is because this is exactly what happened 12 years ago. Um, and in fact, just to, to you know, we've talked a little about the mercury, the, the mercury standards. There's a kind of a, a, a famous case that you know we talk about from time to time, which was um, that that rule that it was proposed by the Obama administration. There were these competing job estimates. One set of claims arguing it's going to be 1.4 million jobs lost. Another one arguing it'd be 1.4 million jobs gained. 
And actually, there's been very few actual job effects, net effects from the regulation. And so one of the values, or one of the benefits. And can uh, I ask, is that is that because it did do a lot to shutter coal plants, but basically that's been roughly offset by happen, renewable yeah, energy? So, right. Well, I think that for one thing, we were never talking about the 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 um, the, the employment numbers weren't from coal. The, the, in those reports, mm -hmm. they weren't from shuttered coal facilities. They were from things like increased electricity prices driving other changes in the economy. Oh, so okay. you have to like get into the weeds of these models to actually figure out how do they get to these outrageous exactly. numbers. Okay. Um, but uh, there's just, there's no empirical evidence that anything like the order, an order of magnitude, anything like the order of magnitude employment effects that they've described it can be attributed to these rules. So, um, so in any case, that's, that's kind of, that's the, but, but nevertheless, we're still gonna go through this exercise where there's gonna be lots of inflated uh, numbers that are gonna get tossed around. And one of the values of agencies taking these questions seriously, even if it turns out that after all the analysis they do, they just predict say a few thousand job gains or a, a few thousand job losses, maybe not a huge kind of economic component of the rule. It's useful to counterbalance this kind of crazed rhetoric that we're very likely to see. Um, okay, well, this is, I feel like this is a timely question, which is how do you reconcile the principle of policy durability with deference to electoral transitions? Is there a definable standard that maintains consistency and respect for administrative practice? That's from Thomas McKinnon. Um, so well, um, some policies don't have that much durability. <laughs> you know, we have Obama policies that were undone by the Trump administration, which will probably be um, undone by the Biden administration. I think one of the things we've learned about durability is that is the following. Um, significant, the significant policies of the Obama administration from the first term, uh, especially in the environmental area, ended up sticking. Um, a lot of the second term policies um, were still kind of tied up in litigation when the administration ended and were easier to undo. So one of the lessons from this is that if there's gonna be um, significant policy done through regulation, which is certainly the world we're living in. Um, what you need to do is um, uh, move quickly um, to regulate, to, to, you know, to propose a rule, to finalize a rule, um, move quickly through just review process, and then get reelected or have at least someone from your party get elected for that second term. Right. Uh, that helps a lot and makes things durable. I mean, I think we, it is the case that when a lot of the work is done through regulation, it's hard for a one-term president to make the policies very durable. Legislation used to be thought of as different, uh, used to be thought of as more durable, but I think one thing we've learned there is that it's become essentially so durable that it's impossible. So we just don't see significant substantive legislation. Um, you know, in the Obama administration, we saw um, the Affordable Care Act and the Trump administration, we saw the, the tax cut, but in terms of like big across the board, economy-wide, Legislation, we saw very little. I think the view now is that um, really significant legislation might have to await um, a decision on whether the filibuster stays in place. But that, that that's not going to change right now because even though there have been discussions about whether uh, Democrats in Congress wanted to um, eliminate the filibuster for legislation in the way that Republicans in Congress eliminated for Supreme Court appointments. Um, that would need, I think, a more solid democratic majority that even a 50-50 sure. uh, division would make possible. And then if legislation is done in a simple majority, legislation itself might be less durable uh, because right. then um, we become a little more like a parliamentary government where a new government comes in and they can like undo legislation more quickly. It was a filibuster rule in the Senate that made legislation more durable than regulation. So I think we might be, um, you know, um, exploring, all, you know, moving into a different era. But... Uh, well done, early regulation in a two-term administration can be quite durable. Mm -hmm. right. But this is just a, this is partially a consequence of the politics that we live in. It has, it's, this is a, we still, we're actually in an unusual period in American politics where we just keep turning over control of all of our institutions. That's actually kind of rare. You, in other points in American history, you have much more stable alignments of the parties. Even if you have divided government, you had a very long stretch of Republican presidents and Democratic legislatures starting with Nixon. So it's really this kind of crazy dynamic where we just literally turn everything over um, almost every election 
And it creates no incentive for durability. It creates no incentive for compromise because like why compromise with the other guy? You're just going to win the next election. It's, it's just a, it's a very difficult policy environment. Right. And it also in, um, I was just wondering, we only have a few minutes left. I wanted to ask, you know, obviously towards the end of the book, you, you're, you're obviously kind of making the case for why, you know, even a democratic administration should want to take cost benefit analysis seriously. And I was wondering if you two could both just kind of talk about what, you know, what advice you have, like we've, again, if, if you know, we've had this kind of period where, where w- there have been all these you know, breaks with the norms as we've seen in so many ways in the Trump administration. What is the way for the next administration to kind of restore the integrity of this process and, do, you know, do it in a way that's, that, you know, passes muster? Well, I'll say something quickly. I'll just build on um, a prior comment I made. When I made this prediction uh, about focusing on three areas, um, mm-hmm on getting rid of the like bad analytical underbrush left by the Trump administration, modernizing the various elements of cost benefit analysis to bring them up to date uh, and make them consistent with the best scientific and economic analysis and uh, building up the analytical techniques to take distribution seriously. It was both a prediction and a hope. Um, I think that's what um, the new administration should focus on in, um, in connection with um, the economic analysis of regulation. Now, having said that, there's an enormous incentive for doing this and doing it well. I mean, the courts, which we haven't talked about much in, um, in this discussion, um, in recent years have taken a pretty aggressive position that pushes agencies in the direction of doing economic analysis. That is, you know, Justice Scalia and Michigan versus EPA, the Mercury Rule uh, said a regulation that, um, you know, causes more harm than good is not, um, is not a valid one. And, um, and there's been more intrusive and supervision of the courts in this area, which puts a greater premium for the agencies to do good analysis. So people, you know, there are some people who will, you know, who would prefer cost benefit analysis to just like disappear and OIRA to disappear and so on. I mean, I, I don't think they, um, um, you know, that their views are going to prevail in the near future. But one of the reasons it would be a real mistake for that to happen is that it would make agency regulations more vulnerable in the courts. The courts have started um, becoming significant actors in this area and pushing in a certain direction. Yeah. Do you want to elaborate on that, Michael? Uh, yeah, so I'll kind of offer my pessimistic view on this, which is the kind of the limits of what the Biden administration Okay. Um, so, so I, so, you know, Ricky and I have similar views about the kinds of things that this administration ought to pursue, but ultimately I think the question that was going to get figured out in the next few years, this term and, and forward is whether cost benefit analysis is going to become a partisan issue, whether it's going to become the domain of the democratic party, um, and the Republican party is going to be the party of deep state and, you know, job killing regulation and war on coal and that kind of rhetoric. Um, I certainly hope not, but I, there has to be, a, a, I think, a concerted effort amongst leaders of the Republican Party to make a decision to move away from that style of kind of opposition and move back towards kind of an earlier tradition within the party of embracing these kinds of ideas. And so that's what I'm going to personally be looking for. Um, I'm optimistic about the direction the Biden administration is going to take, and I'll just say as a question mark what's going to happen um, uh, on the other side. Okay. Um, well, we are, are right at three o'clock. So um, I want to thank the Institute for Policy Integrity for sponsoring this, of course, to Ricky and Michael for participating and to everyone who joined for what was a really interesting discussion. So thanks so much. <laughs>